So I hope you kept your Bibles there open in 1 Peter chapter 4. 1 Peter chapter 4. And I want you to look at verse number 12. 1 Peter chapter 4 and verse number 12, which reads, Beloved, think it, <coughs> sorry, beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you, as though some strange thing happened unto you. The title for the sermon this morning is The Fiery Trial. The Fiery Trial, okay? So don't think it's strange if you're going through some fiery trials. Don't think it's strange if you're going through some difficulties in this life. It's a normal part of your Christian life. In fact, we're going to soon see that it's a part of everybody's life. Whether you're saved or not saved, everybody goes through some fiery trials, but it's how you want to be going through that fiery trial that, that matters, that differs from the unbelieving world. Now let's start off with verse number one. Now for our visitors here for the first time, uh, what I normally do on a Sunday morning, we go chapter by chapter through the Bible, okay? We've been going through First Peter, we're up to First Peter chapter 4, and basically this sermon is we're just going to go through the, the entire chapter, verse by verse, and expanding on God's truth, okay? That's the purpose here. And uh, <clears throat> if we look at verse number 1, and before I look at verse number 1, I'm going to be spending a big chunk of this sermon just on, chapter, just on verse number 1, okay? Then we'll get to the rest of it. And I say this because it's probably going to be a bit of an unpopular sermon in verse number one. I already know because I know some of the beliefs some of you guys hold uh, because of different preachers that you may or may not listen to. And I, I differ in this area when it comes to the suffering of Christ, okay? And uh, so let's look at verse number one there, First Peter chapter 4, verse number one. And as we've been going through First Peter, I just want you to think about what does the Bible emphasize? When, when we talk about Christ's suffering, what kind of suffering does the Bible emphasize? And you know what? Me as a Bible preacher, me as a pastor, I know you come to this church to hear the Bible preached, okay? And so what the Bible emphasizes, that's what I'm going to emphasize, okay? And when the Bible may be somewhat unclear and I don't fully understand, guess what? You're not going to hear that from me necessarily, okay? You might hear things that other preachers are confident and sure about and they can preach boldly about certain things. Hey, but you may not necessarily hear that from me. It's not that I'm trying to avoid the topic. I just don't have that confidence. I don't have the same assurance that other preachers do. Hey, but if they're preaching and they're still preaching great truth, they're preaching the gospel, they're saved, praise God for them, you know? One thing you need to learn in the Christian life is not everybody's going to agree on everything, okay? Not everyone's going to see the scriptures in the same light, okay? Now, I'm not talking about the major things. I'm not talking about the gospel, I'm not talking about Christ, the deity of Christ and the Trinity. I'm not talking about creation and, you know, that God created all things some over 6,000 years. I'm not talking about those fundamental, easy to understand black and white truths. But there are some things in the Bible that you're just going to have to accept that we come and we have different opinions on. You know, different influences, different backgrounds, and we're just going to approach the Bible. We're just going to see it differently. You know, one person that sees it differently, that I can't see it, they're like, what, can't you see what I can see? It's black and white. And I'm like, yeah, can't you see what I can see? It's black and white. Are we going to divide over that? Are we going to split over that? No, because we, it's free. It's fine to have, you know, freedom. The Bible, uh, well, one of the uh, Baptist distinctives is individual soul liberty the priesthood of the believer. Hey, we have direct access to God. Each one of us have the Holy Spirit. And you know what? There are some truths that you're going to understand in the Bible that I'm not going to fully understand. That's just the nature of it. That's life. But what, hey, once we get to heaven, guess what? We're all going to be all united in doctrine, 100%. Okay? But look at verse number one. Let's start there. So there's a long introduction. Verse number one. For as much then as Christ hath suffered for us, and it's very important, the next few words, okay? In the flesh. Arm yourselves likewise with the same mind, for he that have suffered in the flesh have ceased from sin. All right? Now, first thing I want you to notice here, the Bible emphasizes, in fact, all of 1 Peter emphasizes that the suffering of Christ, that he paid for our sins, that he, that he was that sacrifice, okay? What, the, what 1 Peter emphasizes is that the suffering was in the flesh, in his body, Okay? Now, if you can please go to chapter 1, 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 19. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 19. I just want to show you this is a major theme in 1 Peter. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 19, it says, But with the precious blood of Christ, and as a lamb without blemish and without spot. This is talking about how we were redeemed, that we were not redeemed by corruptible things, but we've been redeemed with incorruptible. And it goes on to explain that that incorruptible is the precious blood of Christ and the fact that he's a lamb without blemish and without spot. That's speaking about his, his body. His body was without blemish, uh, blemish. He had no sin in his body. And so the Bible emphasizes from chapter one, it's his blood and his body that has redeemed us. Okay, It's his blood and his body that has redeemed us. Now this shouldn't surprise us. 
Because when Christ had held the Last Supper and he spoke about how we are to re remember him, how we are to bring to remembrance his suffering, his sacrifice, what did he tell us to remember? The blood and the body. I'll just read to you 1 Corinthians 11 verse 23 says, For I have received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he be was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you, this do in remembrance of me. So when, God's, when Jesus says, I want you to remember what I've done for you, I want you to remember my sacrifice, he says, take this bread, that's when we do the Lord's Supper, hey, that represents my body, right? And then in verse number 25, he says, after the same manner, also he took the cup, when he had supped, saying, this cup is the New Testament in my blood, this do ye as oft as ye drink it in remembrance of me. He says, how else can you remember my sacrifice? When you drink of that grape juice, when you drink of that cup, Okay, that represents my blood. I want you to remember my blood, my body. This is what redeems you. Okay, verse number 26. For as often as ye eat this bread and drink this cup, ye do show the Lord's death till he come. Hey, how do we show the Lord's death? By remembering his body and his blood, the bread and the grape juice. Okay, now I know some of you strongly believe, this is where, you know, be unpopular, that Christ's soul went to hell, and I believe that, okay? but that he also suffered in the fires of hell. Now, let me, look, maybe you're right. I don't know, okay? But as I told you, I don't have the confidence of that, okay? I don't have, I, I don't see the black and white scriptures. I don't read 1 Peter chapter 1, and, oh yeah, he suffered in hellfire. What I see when I study 1 Peter and other passages of the Bible is that his body, his blood was the sacrifice, that he suffered in the flesh. Those are the things that the Bible emphasizes. I'm going to emphasize that. Okay, And as I said, if other pastors want to emphasize something else that they feel confident about, so be it. I don't have that same level of confidence. You say, well, Pastor Kevin, what did he do for three days and three nights? I don't know. Okay? The Bible doesn't emphasize it. Okay? All I know is his soul was in hell, his body was in the grave, and his spirit was with the Father in heaven. Amen. When he told the thief on the cross, today that should be with me in paradise, that's because Jesus was there as well. Okay, I believe it all, okay, that he's, he was in three places. Say, so how is that possible? He's God. Don't ask me to explain all the supernatural, spiritual, miraculous things. I can't fully understand it. What I can tell you is what the Bible says, he suffered in the flesh. That's what I believe. He suffered in the flesh. Now, whether you believe he suffered in hell or, or, or just all the suffering was done on the cross, it doesn't take away anything from anybody. We all believe that he paid for all sin. We all believe that he suffered for it. He did it all. He paid for it all. From Adam to the last man that ever lives, he paid for all the sins. The wrath of God was put upon Christ. We, all, we believe that's, that's what's important, that he's paid for your personal sins. And because of that sacrifice, you can be saved. All right? Now look at uh, chapter 2, 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 24. What else am I confident about? 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 24. It says, Who his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree, that we being dead to sins should live unto righteousness, by whose stripes we are healed. What stripes? That's the whipping, the shedding of the blood, his suffering, the beating. That's how I'm healed. And I know that he suffered for my sins. He bare my sins in his own body on the tree, the crucifixion. Hey, I can be confident about that. Okay, I can say, yeah, this is what the Bible emphasizes, the crucifixion, the cross, the blood, the body. That's what I'm going to emphasize. All right? Look at chapter 3, 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 18. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 18. It says here, For Christ also have once suffered for sins. Once. Okay, I believe he suffered once. Okay? For sins. The just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit. What is the Bible emphasizing, brethren? The flesh, the blood, the body, the crucifixion, okay? The death of Christ in that sense, okay? Now, did his soul go to hell? The Bible says he did, okay? I, I can prove that. But what happened exactly? I don't know, brethren, okay? We all have different opinions exactly. Oh, I, I can't fully wrap my head around that. I don't have these black and white scriptures like we're reading right now to, to teach you that. So, you know, I, as, as I told you, I'm a preacher that wants to preach the Bible, black and white verses. I want to have clear verses that you can build your, ground your faith in, okay? All I care about is that you understand Jesus paid for your sins. He's paid for it all, okay? And don't, don't miss the fact that it's his body and his blood. That's how Christ wanted us to remember his death, by his body and his blood, okay? Now, 
I want you to have noticed that, that it said he suffered once for sin. So I believe that was it. When, when he was on the cross, his body, when he, he died there, that's, that was the suffering of the sins. It was a once suffering that took place, okay? That's what I believe. Now, please, go to, keep your finger there and go to Isaiah 53. Go to Isaiah 53. Isaiah 53, very famous chapter in the Bible, in the Old Testament, that speaks about the suffering of Christ, okay? And let me just show you one passage where people turn to to say, well, his soul actually went to hell. And his soul was the offering. His soul was the thing that uh, was paying for our sins rather than his body, okay? Or in conjunction with his body or something like that, okay? So Isaiah, Isaiah 53 verse 10. Isaiah 53 verse 10. The passage here is, it says, Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He have put him to grief when thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin. He shall see his seed, he shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. So the argument is, so see, the Bible's saying here that Christ's soul is the offering for sin. So it's not his body, it's his soul. And so of course, after that, you know, they'll teach that once Christ was crucified on the cross, then his soul went to hell. Okay, and that was the actual sacrifice. That was the actual offering. Now remember, keep pay, paying attention to how it says there, make his soul an offering for sin. Let's understand that for a moment, okay? But the other thing I want you to notice in this verse, okay, look at the first part of it. It says, yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. What's a bruise? A bruise is broken capillaries in your body, okay? It's broken blood vessels in your body, okay? So the argument then becomes, hey, in this verse, is this speaking about the soul without the body? Or is it speaking about the soul within the body? Because listen, when your body's suffering, you're, you know, even if your, your soul is in you, right? When you're suffering, when your body's suffering, your soul is suffering as well. Right. Your soul is your life. You know, you can have anguish in the body, which also translates to anguish in the soul. Okay, soul is your life. Quite often the Bible will teach, you know, many times just refer, hey, I think it was a previous passage that said there were eight souls saved by water. Speaking of, you know, uh, Noah and his family in the ark. Was it saying that his, the souls were completely detached? No, the souls were saved because they were in the body and within the, the, the ark, they were saved by the flood. Now, I want you to stay there in Isaiah 53, if you can, and I'm going to read to you from Hebrews 10. If you're fast enough to turn there, you're fast enough. If not, don't worry about it. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 4, which reads, For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and of goats should take away sins. Wherefore, when he cometh into the world, he saith, Sacrifice and offering thou wouldest not, but a body... Thou hast, hast thou prepared me, but a body hast thou prepared me, okay? So the body of Christ was the preparation of the sacrifice. Speaking about the sacrifice of the Old Testament, they were not sufficient to take away sins, okay? But a body was prepared. Now, if you drop down to verse number 9, it says, in the same chapter, Hebrews 10, verse 9, it says, Then said he, Lo, I come to do thy will, O God. He taketh away the first, Let's take away the first, co the first covenant, the old covenant, that he may establish the second. Look at verse number 10. By the which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Hey, what did first Peter say? That he was suffered once. Okay, what does Hebrews say? He suffered once for all. What else does it say there in Hebrews 10? Uh, verse 10, it says that it was the offering of the body of Christ. The offering was the body of Christ. So when we read Isaiah 53, verse 10, which said, made his soul an offering for sin. Yeah, because the soul's in the body, that's what was bruised for us. Okay, so I mean, this isn't a contradiction. This goes well together. This is, this, uh, this is perfect. Okay, and so look, when I read Isaiah 53, 10, I'm not, I'm not thinking that Christ suffered in hell there. I'm thinking, and I'll, I'll, sh I'll show it to you soon, that this is his suffering on the cross. This is his body being broken for us. This is his blood being shed for us, okay? If you're, if you're still in Hebrew, uh, Isaiah 53, go to verse number 11. Isaiah 53, verse number 11. It says, He shall see of the travail of his soul, so there's the reference of the soul again, and shall be satisfied. By his knowledge shall my righteous servant justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. Hey, what did First, first Peter, where, where are the, our iniquities born on? On his body, on his flesh. Remember that? Okay. So he's bare the iniquities and the flesh. But look at verse number 12. This clarifies. It says, Therefore will I divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he hath poured out his soul unto death, and he was numbered. By the way, before I read that, he's poured out his soul unto death. What do you have? Straight after that. Semicolon. Right? Is that a semicolon or a colon? No, colon. That's a colon, right? And a colon. So after the colon, normally when you read your Bibles, it's going to explain what that just said. 
right? I mean, that, that's normally how the King James Bible is written, right? You've got your colon. What follows gives further detail of what was just said previously. So let's, see, let's read that again. Because he have poured out his soul unto death. Well, what does that mean? And he was numbered with the transgressors, and he bare the sin of many, and made intercession for the transgressors. What is that about? And he was numbered with the transgressors. It's not that hard. You know, I'll read to you from Mark 15, verse 27, about the crucifixion of Christ. It says, And with him they crucified two thieves, the one on his right hand and the other on his left. And the scripture was fulfilled, which saith, and he was numbered with the transgressors. Okay? So when we read Hebrew, uh, Isaiah 53, verse 12, and it says that he poured out his soul unto death, and he was numbered with the transgressors, Hey, that's not speaking about hell. That's speaking about the, the fulfillment of Scripture which took place at His crucifixion. He was numbered amongst the transgressors because on His right hand and on His left hand there were thieves that He was crucified with. Okay? That's what, the, that's what it's about. All right? So, look, I don't know if you've, you, know, you don't agree with me or you have other thoughts around that, but I'm just showing you clear Scriptures. You know, suffering in the, in the, in the flesh. His body was the offering. Yeah, yeah, his souls was the offering. Yeah, he bore his, our sins in his body. Yeah, he was numbered amongst the transgressions when his soul was poured out to death. Yeah, that's the crucifixion. Okay? That's what the Bible emphasizes. That's what I'm going to emphasize. All right? And, you know, my encouragement to you, brethren, is that you really, you know, turn your focus upon those matters. The things that the Bible makes clear. The, 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 uh, the blood, atonement, and the body of Christ, which was a lamb uh, without blemish or without spot. And so, if you... Uh, if, if, sorry, if you, if you're still in Isaiah 53? Yeah, so Isaiah 53, look at verse number 4. Let's move up a little bit further. Isaiah 53, verse 4. Before I read this, because the argument is, you know, what? So you think just, just being crucified, just being whipped and having a crown of thorns upon your head, you think that was sufficient sacrifice? That was sufficient suffering? You think that was enough, you know, for the sins of the entire world? Surely you, you have to understand that he also had to go to hell and burn for all eternity. That's what this real suffering was. Well, that's if you take a very, you know, uh, surface level view on the suffering of Christ. You know, that leading up to the cross, that's all he, su all he suffered was the physical suffering of, of his body. But no, the Bible told us that he also suffered in his soul, okay? Which was at the time within his body. Because look, it's not just the, the punishment. It's not just the, the, the physical uh, pain that was afflicted upon Jesus that hurt him. Look at verse number four, Isaiah 53 verse four. It says, surely he have borne our griefs. Hey, it's not, he didn't just die for our sins, also our grief. Anytime you've been upset, he paid for that and carried our sorrows. Okay, Any, anytime you've been upset, anytime you've been worried, you know, you've, you've shed tears, you know, Jesus felt that as well. You know, he paid for that as well. It says, yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. Okay, now this passage is repeated for us in the New Testament. Let me show you where. If you're fast enough, go to Matthew chapter 8. You can move away from Isaiah if you want. Let's go to Matthew chapter 8, verse number 14. Okay? Matthew chapter 8, verse number 14 actually tells us when this is fulfilled or how this was fulfilled in Christ. Matthew chapter 8, verse number 14. Matthew 8, 14 reads, And when Jesus was come into Peter's house, he saw his wife's mother laid and sick of a fever, and he touched her hand, and the fever left her, and she arose and ministered unto them. So normally when we read about Jesus just healing the sick, we just think, all right, he's healed the sick and they're, they're perfect. And they are perfect, okay? But what happened to that sickness? Where did it go? Did it just disappear? No. Look at verse number 16. When the even was come, they brought unto him many, so not just Peter's wife, I mean Peter's uh, mother-in-law who got healed, but when the even was come, they brought unto him many that were possessed with devils, and he cast out the spirits with his word, and healed all that were sick. So, he, you know, of course, you know Jesus' ministry. He's, healing, he's constantly healing people. He's constantly casting out devils. And the pain and the suffering that, those, that devil possession brought upon people, look at verse number 17. That it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet. That's what we read in Isaiah 53. Saying, himself took our infirmities and bare our sicknesses. Jesus paid for my sins, yeah. That's great, he did pay for your sins. But you know what? He also paid for the sorrow of your sins. He also paid for the grace of your sins. If you've ever been under, you know, a demonic attack or some extent, you know, and you've, been, you've suffered through that, Jesus paid for that as well. He felt that as well. You know, any sicknesses you've had to face in your body, you know, Jesus took that upon himself as well. Amen. All your sicknesses, all your sorrow. You know, how much did Christ suffer? I can't even understand it. I can't even process it. I can't. I can't, you know. 
When the Bible says that Jesus became a curse for us, the curse for us, hey, every pain, any anguish as a result of the curse, when Adam and Eve sinned against the Lord and the Lord cursed the earth, all of that, all of the effects of the curse was put on Christ. He became the curse for us. He took it all so we can be free, you know? So whatever you're suffering, brethren, whatever sicknesses you may have right now in your body that, that brings you low, that makes you suffer, that gives you a lot of pain, you know, Jesus felt that as well. Felt your pain. Your pain was put on Jesus. Your suffering was put on Jesus, you know? What are we going to do in return for him? He's done it for you, okay? He's born that. So you can go to the Lord and ask him for help. He knows exactly what you feel. He knows exactly what you're suffering with, all right? Now, back to 1 Peter chapter 4, please. 1 Peter chapter 4, verse number 2. 1 Peter chapter 4, verse number 2. So why does the Bible, why does 1 Peter just keep telling us, the major theme, Christ suffered, Christ suffered, Christ suffered. Why does he keep telling us? Because we are to live in response to that, right? Now that we know that Christ has suffered, salvation is a free gift paid for by Christ, how are we going to respond to that great truth that Christ suffered for us? Verse number two, it says that he no longer should live the rest of his time in the flesh to the lust of men, but to the will of God, okay? So what is this teaching us? It, sa it says here that basically, you know, just like Christ allowed himself to, be su to suffer, just as Christ allowed his flesh to be destroyed and crucified, well, you know what? In our, we have flesh as well, and it's a very wicked flesh, okay? It's a very sinful flesh. We have the sin nature in our flesh. Well, our response are to, to not live in accordance to our flesh, that we ought to crucify that flesh as well, okay, in response to what Christ has done for us and to live in accordance to the will of God. I'll just read a few passages to you. Galatians chapter 2, verse 20 says, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me, and the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. Okay? So what are we commanded to do, brethren? To crucify this flesh. What, physically put ourselves on a, on a, on a cross? No. All right? To just not live in accordance with this flesh. Understand your flesh is wicked. Your flesh wants to sin. Your flesh wants to rebel against God. Okay? Well, put that aside. Crucify that flesh. All right? And live in accordance to the Spirit of God. You know, it says in Luke 9, 23, these are the words of Jesus. He says, And he said to them all, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. Hey, we're to take up our own cross, crucify our own flesh daily, daily. That means every day you wake up in the flesh. Every day you wake, wake up not wanting to serve God, wanting to live in accordance to your lust, your desires. Hey, Pick up the cross daily and crucify that flesh, okay? And the Bible says in Galatians 5, 24, And they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit, okay? So that's our response. Christ suffered for us. He put away, He, he, he suffered in the flesh. The flesh was crucified. Well, that's a picture of us now having to crucify that flesh mortifying the, 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 the deeds of this body, living in the Spirit, walking in, not just living in the Spirit, but walking in the Spirit, doing the commandments that God wants us to do. Look at verse number three, I better hurry up. For the time past of our life may suffice us to have wrought the will of the Gentiles when we, when we walked in lasciviousness, lusts, excess of wine, revelings, banquetings, and abominable idolatries, wherein they think it strange that you run not with them to the same excess of riot, speaking evil of you. Okay, so now we have a, a list of sins that you probably did. I know you look at that sin, I know, I know I did some of those, okay? And that should be our former life. That should be our life without Christ. But now that we have crucified the flesh, we want to get rid of that daily, we ought to live differently, okay? So let's go through that list very quickly, verse number three. When we walked in lasciviousness, that's basically sins, like sexual sins, fornication, adultery. Then it says lust, so this is more of a general term. Lust is the general satisfying of the flesh, fleshly desires. The next one's kind of funny. It says excess of wine, okay? Now look, I believe very strongly that the Bible commands us not to drink alcohol, that drinking alcohol is a sin, okay? But some people, they want to find a way to get around this. And they'll say, well, look, it says excess of wine. You can have a little bit. Just don't be excessive, because it'll make you drunk. All right? And I, I've, who's, who's heard that argument before from that passage? Yeah. 
It's a very common passage, right? But just drop down to verse number four. Let's have a look at the same, just li literally the next verse, okay? It says in verse number four, wherein they think it's strange that ye run not with them to the same excess of riot. So taking that argument that you can have a little wine but not excessive wine, well, the next verse, then I can riot. Hey, I can be unruly. I can be disobedient. Just, just a little bit, but not excessive. Do you see how stupid that argument is? <laughs> right? That is a stupid argument when you just look at the next verse, okay? Otherwise, next verse is basically saying, hey, just go crazy. Just don't overdo it. <laughs> you know? <laughs> it's, it's strange. The next one is uh, reve re uh, revelings. Revelings. That's like taking, you know, having wild parties. Maybe, you know, the clubbing scene is kind of that kind of idea. Banquetings. Now, there's nothing wrong with having a banquet, having a feast, enjoying each other company and some food. But banquet is, of course, overindulging in food, right? That's what, that's what he's referring to. You know, glutton, the sin of gluttony, overeating, overindulging in food. And then it says abominable idolatries. So it's maybe some of you guys came from false religion. Maybe you had some statues of Mary or some saints or who knows what, you know. You, so we, we don't, we, we don't want to live in accordance to the world. And because we're commanded to live differently, and because I'm sure many of you are living differently from the, your former lives before you were saved, it then says in verse number four, wherein they, that's the unsaved world, think it's strange, and they think you're strange that you run not with them to the same excess of riot, speaking evil of you, okay? So here's what you've got to learn. When you live for God, when you live for His righteousness, when you're trying to fight sin, when you don't want to live the wicked lifestyle of the world, the world's going to think you're strange, and that's fine. We've learned that already. We're strangers, we're foreigners. You know, our kingdom is a, uh, uh, you know, the heavenly kingdom, not this earthly kingdom, but they will also speak evil of you. They say, oh, you know, you know why he lives like that? He thinks he's so good. You know, I, I'll be at work. I just, I, I keep myself from evil. Just trying to work hard, keep myself from evil. Oh, he just wants to suck up to the boss. It's like, no, I want to I, I live for Jesus. That's why. You know, oh, the reason he doesn't go to the Christmas party and get drunk with us is because he looks down on us. He doesn't think highly of us. What are you talking about? Uh, you know, I'm probably the best worker you've got. I'm always trying to find a way to make your life a lot easier. Okay, but you, you, you know, you're just trying to justify yourself you know, by making Christians look bad. Right. You know, that's, but that's, hey, that's life. That's, that's what we need to get used to. Now, um, if you can please, uh, let's go, look, actually, yeah, let's go to verse number five. Verse number five. And look, there's nothing wrong with going to a Christmas party. You know, if, you know, if you're going to that, there's nothing wrong with that at all. I'm just saying I did not go to a Christmas party because I knew what was going on there. I knew the drunkenness. I knew the the lewdness, I knew that women were there without their husbands and husbands were there without their wives, you know. I, I knew that was going on, so I, don't wanna, I didn't want to find myself in that position. The only time I went to a Christmas party was when the owners were Christians themselves. You know, they were members of my church and at Blessed Hope Baptist Church. That's the only time I've ever gone to a Christmas party, okay. I'm talking about the, the work party, I'm not talking about the family Christmas parties and stuff like that, okay. Verse number five, verse number five. It says, Who shall give account to him that is ready to judge the quick and the dead? So this is what we already know, the fact that, hey, we ought to live righteous lives because God's going to judge us, okay? But He's not only going to judge us, the quick, that's quick is the living, that's the, those that are living, but He's also going to judge the dead. He's going to judge those that are dead without Christ, okay? God's going to judge the saved and the unsaved, and when He judges believers, He's going to judge us for the works that we've done for Him. He's going to reward us for the works that we've done for Him, okay? There are treasures to be had in heaven, but when He comes to judge the unbelievers, He's going to judge them in their sin because they did not accept the sacrifice of Christ, and they're going to find themselves facing judgment, you know, in the lake of fire. Verse number six. For, for this cause, was the gospel preached also to them that are dead, that they might be judged according to men in the flesh, but live according to God in the Spirit. Now, when it came to this entire chapter, chapter verse number six was the hardest one for me to sort of wrap, wrap my head around. But what I found easy to help me understand this, especially the middle, the middle uh, phrase, which says that they might be judged according to men in the flesh. I couldn't really wrap my head around that, so I kind of set that aside for a moment and read it like this. For, for this cause was the gospel preached also to them that are dead. Who are these people, these dead people that the gospel is being preached to? But now if you read the third phrase, but live according to God in the Spirit. Okay, so this is talking about saved people. The fact that we've had the gospel preached to us, we were spiritually dead, but we've been made alive according to God in the Spirit. Okay, we've been born of the Spirit. And then we can go back to that other phrase, which said that they might be judged according to men in the flesh. So who's being judged? Us, the saved, those that believe the gospel. Okay, so what is this saying? Okay, this is basically saying, in if, like, it's, it's, it's the same as Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1, which says, And you have he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sin, okay? So from God's perspective, we were dead, 
but now we've been quickened, we've been made alive, we've been given life, okay? We, we've, uh, we, the, the new life, the new man that is within us because we are saved. But then when it comes to that second part, that they might be judged according to men in the flesh, the fact is, it's the same thing that we read in verse number 4, you know, where it says that they speak uh, evil of you, okay? So as we live for the Lord, as we live for the Lord, the, the world's going to judge you according to your flesh, okay? He's going, they're going to judge you, hey, whether you're doing right or whether you're doing wrong, they're going to judge you in accordance to the flesh, but the Lord looks at your spirit. The Lord looks at the fact that you are a saved child of God. Verse number 7, it says, But the end of all things is at hand. Be ye therefore sober and watch unto prayer. Now, I do believe verse number 7 is on the end times. Okay, I do believe that's about the end times, specifically because it says, Be ye therefore sober and watch unto prayer, which was the same instruction that Paul gave the Thessalonian church in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 6, which says, Therefore let us not all sleep, as do others, but let us watch and be sober, okay? So this is in light of the end times. So what, what is this talking about? The fact that we are to live godly, righteous lives, living after the will of God, and keeping in the back of our minds that the Lord is coming back, that Jesus is coming back. We ought to be living in light of the return of Christ, okay? This is not teaching a pre-tribulation rapture, okay? It's just saying in the fact that the, the, fact that the Lord Jesus Christ is coming back, let's live in accordance to that way, Okay? Verse number eight, and above all things, okay? Now, whenever it says things like this, you've got to pay attention. And above all things, or if it says, you know, above all, you know, pay attention to that verse. You know, if you've got a Bible, if you used to highlight in your Bible, anytime you see those phrases, just highlight, because this is so important, okay? And above all things, have fervent charity among yourselves, for charity shall cover the multitude of of sins. Verse number nine, use hospitality one to another without grudging. All right, so what is this teaching? Okay, this is teaching that within brethren, we're going to sin against each other. Okay, now there might be someone, I don't know, there might be someone in this church that you feel very bitter towards right now. Okay, there's someone in this church maybe that you're frustrated, you know, maybe they've sinned against you, maybe they've done you wrong. Okay, or maybe the reverse is true. Maybe someone's bitter towards you. And maybe you don't even know why. You know, why is this person bitter toward me? You know, they think you've done something wrong to them. Maybe you don't even know. You haven't got a clue what that is, okay? What it is saying here, above all, have fervent, okay? This is passionate. You know, fervent is like fire, charity. What's charity? Love, okay? Among yourselves, for charity shall cover the multitude of sins. You know what you do? If you're feeling frustrated, bitter about a, a brother or sister in the Lord that may have done you wrong, you know what you show toward them? Oh, I, I ignore them. No. I don't talk to them. No, that's not what it says. It's so show them fervent charity. Show them love. Do good to them, okay? And guess what? When you start doing good toward them, you're going to start bitterness. That frustration is going to leave you. It's going to cover the multitude of sins. Whatever sins they've done towards you, brethren, just, just, just love them. Be good to them, okay? And it's going to help you oversee those sins that they've committed against you. And brethren, same thing. You know, if someone's bitter towards you, you have no idea why, just be good to them. Just show them love, okay? Just be fervent in your love toward your brother. Above all, this is so important for a church to function. It's so easy for a church to split. It's so easy to be frustrated in church. Every church is the same. You say, man, New Life Baptist Church, we're constantly divided, we're constantly frustrated. I don't know. I'm just, just maybe in your mind you're thinking that, right? It's the same in any church. You leave this church and go find another church, you're going to find the same thing, eventually okay? And probably the second time you go, you're just going to ignore it. It's like, well, I was wrong the first time. And I'm just going to put up, you know, yeah, this is a wonderful church. It's, it's all good. We don't have any problems here. Yeah, right. Every, everyone knows the truth. Everyone knows that every church has divisions and problems within, amongst the brethren. This is why Peter's telling us, above all, just show love no matter what, okay? And that's going to cover. That's going to help you overcome the sins. You're not going to be thinking about how they sinned against you. You're just going to say, you know what? I just love them. Jesus paid for them. Jesus suffered for them just as much as he suffered uh, for me. All right. And then look at verse number 10. As every man have received the gift, even so minister the same one to another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. Now, I want you to notice verse number 10. It says, every man, this is everybody, all of you, everyone right now, every man have received the gift. Say, what gift? Well, even so minister the same one to another. It's a gift that allows you to minister to one another, okay? Now, very, you know, let me give you two people right now that are working, that are serving you, that are ministering you in love. That's me, all right? I've been given a gift of preaching. I've been given the gift of, you know, uh, 
teaching. And so that's what I'm doing right now. I'm ministering you with the Word of God, right? I'm taking that gift and I'm using it to serve this body. You know, someone else that's really working right now, Brother Matt, back there with the live stream, with the audio, with the systems, making sure that it's all running and working properly. Hey, he's laboring. That's a gift that's been given to him by God. He's using that gift to minister this church, okay? Now, all of you, now, some of you came in early, cleaned up. Hey, that's a gift God has given you, okay? God has given us, and you've got to work out what that gift is. I want you to think about it. What is that gift? Look at verse number 11. It says, if any man speak, let him speak of the oracles of God. So that's, that's me. I'm preaching the oracles of God, right? I, I'm, I've been given that gift. If any man minister, let him do it as of the ability which God giveth. Okay? So you don't, you don't have to be like someone else. Just use the ability that God has given you and use that ability. Okay? That God in all things may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom be praise and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Okay, so when we minister one another toward one another, when we use the gifts that God has given us, it glorifies God. It glorifies God. It glorifies Jesus Christ. Okay, now the challenge then is, well, what gift do I have? How do I serve this church? Now, I I want you to think about that yourself. Just self-examination, you know, think about the last month, okay, the last four or five weeks. How have you served this church? How have you used the gift that God has given? You say, I don't have a gift. The Bible just told me you've been given a gift. I don't, know what, I don't know what it is. I don't know what everyone's gift is. I have no idea. You know. You probably know. You know what you can do to help this church. You know what you're able to do to serve this church. Well, just take that gift and use it and do it. All right? If you want to run it by me, run it by me, and I'll just give you an official ministry. Okay, that's your job moving forward. Praise God. Okay? It glorifies God. But you need to understand the reverse is also true. That if you don't use the gifts that God has given you, then it doesn't glorify God. I, I think you want to be in church. I think you want to be someone that glorifies God. But you know what? If you're not using the gift, you're not ministering to one another, you're not glorifying God. Okay? So think about it. What is it that I can do to serve this church? Remember, you're serving Christ. You're not necessarily serving Pastor Kevin. Okay? You're serving Jesus Christ. You're glorifying God. In 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 1, it says... This is Paul speaking. Of course, Paul, a great, a great apostle, he says, Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not charity, I am become as sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. Okay? So he says, look, if, if you don't have charity in your service, you might as well just be a percussion instrument. You know? It's, it's like if, if I'm just preaching and I'm just preaching for myself, I don't do it out of love for the brethren. All you're hearing is this, bang, 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 blah, blah, blah. I don't want to be that kind of preacher, okay? I want to be the one that loves the brethren, that you're actually benefiting from the preaching that's going on behind the scenes, all right? And look, are there people like this in churches? There are. It's like some people can serve in church and not shut up about what they did at church, all right? Oh, you know, yeah, I was so busy yesterday. I was there vacuuming and I was there cleaning the windows and oh, yeah, if it wasn't for me, the church wouldn't be running, wouldn't be functioning, it's like, man, you're the tinkling brass. You, you, you're that sound. You're not doing that of charity. You're doing it just for the praise of man. That's not Paul. And then he says in verse number two, and though I have the gift of prophecy, so he's got the gift of being able to proclaim God's word and understand all minis- mis- mysteries. Man, this guy understands more than I do. And all knowledge. And then he says, and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains and have not charity, I am nothing, Paul says. Okay, so when Paul was serving the church, when he was using the gifts that God gave him, and he had a lot of gifts there, we saw that, right? He made sure he had charity. He made sure he, he did it out of love to minister to the saints, okay? And so when you serve this church, brethren, do it out of love for your brethren, okay? And again, that'll, that'll cover a multitude of sins, all right? That'll make you think uh, more highly of your brethren as you go and serve them rather than being frustrated and, and angry about every little issue that comes up. Verse number 12, 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 12. 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 12. Then it says this. Now, because, you know, verse number 11 ended with amen. So we start kind of like a new thought now, okay? It says, Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you as though some strange thing happened unto you, okay? Now, please go to chapter 1, 1 Peter chapter 1, verse number 7. Because again, this is another theme in this book, okay? The fact that we're going to be tried, go through some difficulties. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse number 7, it says that the trial of your faith being much more precious than of gold that perisheth, 
uh, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honour and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. Remember, we have to keep in mind the fact that Christ is coming back, live in accordance to Christ's second coming. Well, you know what? The Lord wants to try our faith. He wants to make us more righteous, make us more godly, make us more like Christ. He wants to burn away the desires of the flesh and the desires for you to sin. He wants to you know, uh, purge you of all that so you can be tried in fire. Many trials, many difficulties you go through is just because the Lord wants to allow you to be tried, to, be, to mature, to grow, to become more precious. Okay? Think about that next time you're going through some difficulty. You know, don't turn around and say, well, God, it's not fair. Why am I suffering with this? Hey, turn around and say, God, what is it that you're trying to purify? How are you trying to make me more pleasant, more beautiful, more, more in line with your will? What is it that I need to learn for this trial? I truly believe, I truly believe, you know, in light of the scriptures that I read, that if you don't learn the lesson that, Jesus, that God wants to teach you in your trial, you're just going to stay in that trial. You're just going to stay stuck there. And until you turn around and say, I need to, what is it that I need to learn? Oh, this is what I need to learn. I need to humble myself. Oh, I need to love the brethren. Oh, I need to actually pick up my Bible and read it. Maybe that's my trial. That's what God, oh, I've got to spend time with the Lord. And then when you do that and you come out with the, you know, through the fire, the trial has gone all of a sudden because you've learned the lesson, okay? You learn the lesson. You know, there was a time when if kids did not learn their lessons in school, they would be held back. If you didn't pass the grade, you're going to be held back and you're going to have to repeat that year. Now in schools today, you don't have to do any work you get through, <laughs> okay? <laughs> But that's not with God. God wants you to learn the lesson. He's going to keep trying you. Maybe throw another trial your way if you're that thick-headed. Okay? Try, throw another trial your way if you're that thick-headed. Until you learn. Until you, you allow yourself to be broken down and go through the fire. And accept the fact that God is trying to refine you some way, shape, or form. Or form. All right. Uh, verse number 13, please. Verse number 13. And this is the hardest part for the trial. But how many times does the Bible say this? But rejoice. Oh, what? I want it to be cast down and upset and angry and frustrated about the trial. No, God says rejoice, okay? Inasmuch, why? As ye are partakers of Christ's suffering, that when his glory shall be revealed, that ye may be glad also with exceeding joy, okay? So it says, look, if you just rejoice in your suffering, you're going to have a great joy when Christ comes back. You're going to have great joy when you think about eternity and the new bodies, not struggling with sin anymore, in heaven with the Lord forever for all eternity. You know, the glorious bodies that you're going to receive, you're going to be even more happy in life if you can also find joy in trials. Okay? And as I said, this is the major theme, that Christ has suffered and we need to suffer. Okay? Let me just run through them very quickly. Chapter 1 was basically saying that through His suffering, that we have received salvation. Okay, so there was profit in the suffering of Christ. This is what gives us salvation. Chapter 2 was that we are commanded to submit ourselves to governing authorities, whether you like them or not, whether they're good or whether they're forward, whether they're difficult, whether they're passing laws that you don't agree with. He says, like, submit to that unlawful government because Christ also suffered and submitted himself to an unlawful government. Okay, so just like Christ suffered, you suffer. That's the whole thing. Christ suffered, what's your response? Okay? Chapter 3 was not just governing authorities, but to submit to all authorities in our life. For wives to be submissive to their husbands. You know, for servants to be submissive to their masters. You know, just as Christ submitted himself to death. Okay? This is, this is why this, this whole theme is about suffering. And then, of course, chapter 4, what we're reading about now, is that the suffering, the crucifixion of the flesh of Jesus Christ is an example for us to deny the flesh, to crucify the flesh, to crucify those sinful desires, okay? So every, every aspect of your Christian life, being saved, being submissive to authorities, you know, living for God, it all ought to be a, re, a, a reflection or a response or an answer to what Christ has done for us, okay? When you find yourself uh, losing motivation to live for Christ, just remind yourself, what did Christ do for me? And what am I willing to do in return? Hey, you can't pay it back. It's not about paying Christ back. You'll never pay it back if you try to pay it back. Okay? That's why people are in eternity for hell forever, suffering the torment of hell, because they cannot pay. They can't pay it back. They're just going to suffer for all eternity for rejecting Jesus Christ. And look, Jesus suffered so much for you. What? I mean, really, what is Christ asking from us? Not much, really. Okay? Not much, really, in comparison, in comparison to what he suffered 
for us. Verse number 14, it says, If ye be reproached for the name of Christ, happy are ye. Man, if you're just trying to live like a Christian, he says, you, you, be happy when you're reproached. Be happy when people criticize you. For the spirit of glory and of God resteth upon you. On their part he is evil spoken of, but on your part he is glorified. But let none of you suffer as a murderer or as a thief or as an evildoer, or as a busybody in other men's matters. Yet if any man suffer as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God on this behalf. What is this passage teaching us? That all of us are going to suffer. All of us. But you get to choose how you suffer. Okay? You can either suffer for Christ. You know, you, you, you just do what's right. You do what God wants for you. You do the will of God. And if you suffer that way, well, you're going to suffer that way, okay? It gives glory to God. Hey, he's going to reward you in heaven. Or you can suffer for wrongdoing. You can suffer as a murderer, a thief, evildoer, a busybody. What's quite strange about this, well, not strange, but it shows us how evil being a busybody is. You know, being a gossiper. You know, involving yourself in other men's matters, right? I mean, it just, how evil is it? It's in the same list as a murderer, <laughs> as a thief, as an evildoer. You know, the busy body is just as wicked as all that. It's in the same list. I mean, God could have given us any list, okay? He put the busy body, the one that's, you know, oh, did you hear about brother so-and-so? Oh, did you see what they did to their, what they said to their children? Oh, can you believe they're doing that? And that's like, just be a murderer then. I mean, it's in the same list. It's just, just, just wicked. Verse number 17. That was, a, that was a joke. I'm not saying be a murderer, Okay. <laughs> Verse number 17, almost done now. It says, For the time is come that judgment must begin at the house of God. What's the house of God? The local New Testament church, okay? Judgment must begin here, okay? And if it first begin at us, what shall the end be of them that obey the, not the gospel of God? So those that do not obey the gospel, those that do not believe the gospel are the unsaved. They're going to be judged by God, like we saw already, that God judges the quick and the dead, all right? What this is teaching us, brethren, is that when you come to the house of God, when you come to church, Understand that God is judging us in church. When the preacher preaches the word of God, whether it's me or someone else, you're being judged in accordance to God's words. I expect you to be a little bit uncomfortable. I expect you to say, hey, that's something I need to fix in my life. Okay? Instead of getting, oh, God, I can't believe he said that. Oh, I can't believe he's emphasizing that. Don't get offended. Okay? Judgment begins in the house of God. This is why you're here. Why, why would you come to church if you're going to hear exactly what you want to hear anyway? Right. Just stay home. You come to church to be challenged, okay? Judgment begins here. And so when you listen to preaching, guess what you say? This is about me. What do I need to change? What do I need to do in my family, within my family? It's not like, oh, I hope brother so and so is listening over there. Man, because yeah, that's what, he did that to me last week. And I hope he's listening now. Yeah, pastor, preach it against him. No, don't think like that. Don't, what did it say about being a busybody in other men's matters? Don't worry about everyone else. Yeah, every, everyone else is being judged, yeah. But you're being judged. You know, you're, not, you're not getting the most out of church if you're just thinking about other people. Hey, this, this sermon is about you, okay? It's about you, whoever you are. It's about you, it's about me as well. You know, judgment begins here in the house of God, right? Hey, and even, look, God's going to judge the ungodly. But doesn't he cares more for his children? Okay, he wants to make sure that we're judged, that we fix things, that he will chastise us when we do wrong. Okay, and listen, the judgment that is delayed is much more severe. Okay, even when we stand before God and we're judged, we're going to stand at the great, uh, not great white throne, we're going to be judged at the, uh, the beamer seat, the, the judgment seat of Christ for the works that we've done. He's going to judge us, he's going to reward us. Okay, but those that are unsaved, they're going to stand before Christ at the great white throne. Hey, that judgment's going to be severe, you know, it's going to be severe. That comes afterwards. You know, that's the wrath of God. He's going to cast them into, uh, you know, eternity in hell. You know, what, you know, I'd rather be judged now while he's lenient, while he's merciful, while, you know, I'm, I'm a son of God and he's trying to help me than being judged as an ungodly, unsaved, wicked, un non-believer. You know, Let, let's, be appreci let's appreciate that we can be judged at church with, with the preaching of God's word rather than being judged at the great white throne judgment, Okay. And then it says in number, verse number 18, it says, And if the righteous, that's us, scarcely be saved, where shall the ungodly and the sinner appear? Well, let's, let's answer the, the question. Where shall the ungodly and sinner appear? Well, they're not going to appear. Okay? They're going to be cast into outer darkness. Once they're judged, they're going to be cast into the lake of fire, 
out of darkness, they're not going to appear before God in the same place that we're going to appear before God. But then it says in verse 18, and if the righteous scarcely be saved. There's two ways to understand this verse. I'm a, I don't really have a strong opinion which way it is. It can, be, it can be seen in two ways. Basically, number one, that salvation has nothing to do with us. And so we're scarcely saved because we believed on Christ. I mean, it's like, that, you know, it's not like we even came close to being saved without Christ. <laughs> it's, not, it's not like you're a little more saved than I am, you know, before accepting Christ. No, we, we were not saved, you know. And so it's only through Christ. It, it's a scarce way to be saved, right? That's one way to understand that verse. And I think maybe I lean more toward that one. The other way to understand this, if the righteous scarcely be saved, is the fact that there are few that are saved. You know, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a righteous few. That are, that, that's, that's, that's the scarcity of it, that there's only a few that are saved. I, I, I don't think it matters which way you look at that verse. You know, they're both true anyway. And so, uh, look at verse number 19, last verse. It says, Wherefore, let them that suffer according to the will of God commit the keeping of their souls to Him in well-doing as unto a faithful Creator. So that's the last verse. So if we suffer for good, if we suffer for Christ, okay, it says He commit uh, your, the keeping of your souls to Him in well-doing. What is it saying? It's saying, look, if you suffer for well-doing, just trust in the Lord. Just, 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 I'm suffering for doing good. Just trust in God, okay? He knows your suffering. He's going to uphold you. He's going to give you the strength to go through that. He's teaching you some valuable lesson. He knows what the wicked are doing. He's going to judge the wicked. Hey, they're going to be standing before God at the great white throne judgment. They're going to be cast into hellfire if they reject Jesus Christ. God knows what's going on. He can keep your soul. He can keep you strong. That's what you do when you're suffering. That's what you do when you're going through trial. And brethren, if there's something that I preach today that's difficult for you to uh, digest or accept, and it's something that you need to change in your life, just trust in God. God's going to give you the wisdom. God's going to give you the understanding and say, God, I don't know if I can change this about me in my life. Well, God can do it for you. Just trust in Him. Put your faith in Him. Spend time with Him. He can bring about, hey, if it's a gift that you have that you're not using, ask God, can you help me? Take, find this gift. Can you, is it one? Is it two? How can I serve the church? Please tell me, God, I'm trusting in you to give me the answers that I need. All right, let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord,